just some real quick stuff about the class itself, kind of who it's for, what it's about. Um, a lot of the things that you guys highlighted when you did your introduction is exactly what this class is designed to address. Uh, it really is for the person that has, you know, already has an AR, probably has some very basic knowledge about nomenclature, operations, stuff like that. And it's really to get you um, a foot in the door with some more formalized training, really dial in your techniques, tactics, and procedures for actually handling the gun because uh, there is a specific way to do everything, okay? Um, and particularly with the AR, that can be kind of important, okay? Um, it's not a super complex gun, but it is a little bit more complicated than, than, than your average handgun. So what I want you guys to walk away with today is a fundamental understanding of how to do all the basic stuff, get the gun zeroed, load it, clear malfunctions, all that kind of stuff, okay? So... What I start every class with is a safety brief. Uh, we will do safety brief again when we get out to the range itself. Um, <clears throat> again, to dip back into the purpose behind the class, there's, there's three things that I really want to accomplish, okay? The first and foremost is I want everybody to be safe. I want everybody to walk out of here with the same number of holes you started with at the beginning of the day, okay? Uh, the second one is I want you to get the information that you came to get, okay? So there's specific things that you highlighted that you wanted to learn today. I wanna to make sure that, that that requirement is satisfied for you. And then finally, I want us all to have a good time, okay? Um, I put that last because I don't want everybody to have so much fun that they don't learn anything. And I definitely don't want people to get so goofy that they're not being safe with a gun anymore, okay? Um, I heard a guy say not too long ago, he was talking about, uh, talking about firearms and firearm ownership. And he said, basically, it's like having a pet rattlesnake, you know? Uh, yeah, it's fun, it's cool, but the second that you stop respecting it, you're gonna get bit, okay? So the way we're gonna navigate that today is by obeying these four basic safety rules, okay? First and foremost, we're gonna treat every gun as if it's loaded at all times, okay? So even when you guys came in here today, we made sure that we cleared the guns out, we didn't point them at anybody. Um, that's a big deal with the carbine or the rifle because unlike a handgun, we got an awful lot of mass here. And when we go to pick things up off the ground to do different manipulations, it's real easy for that muzzle to start going off to the side and things like that. So we have to be super cognizant of it, okay? Um, that's of course true with any gun, but it's even more so true with carbine, okay? There's some little nuances and intricacies that we're gonna have to follow to keep us on track to be safe throughout the rest of the day, okay? Um, the second one is we want to keep our finger off the trigger and outside the trigger guard until we're ready to shoot, okay? So when we're out on the range, I want your, your trigger finger to live right on this little shelf here, right underneath your magazine release. There's this little, little raised area of metal right there, okay? That's going to be our index point for where I want your trigger finger at, okay? You see in the back there? Okay, so as soon as we're done shooting, if our eyes are not connected to the target, I want you to come back out of the trigger guard and right here and put some positive pressure right there, okay? <clears throat> what that does for us is if, you know, if we're out in the field or whatnot and we trip, fall, you know, we've got to grab somebody, whatever, our hands have a sympathetic muscle response between them, okay? So if I squeeze with my left hand, I can also end up squeezing with my right hand, and I don't want, if my finger were down here or on that trigger, I don't want to reflexively pull the trigger um, when I don't intend to, okay? So the way we combat that is to make sure we've got a whole bunch of metal between us and that trigger, okay? So again, and there's not a whole lot of truly safe directions around here, but if I'm here, I've been shooting, as soon as my eyes come back off of that target and I'm disconnected from those sights, Finger is going to come back out of the trigger and up along the frame. Okay, that's going to be our hard and fast rule for throughout the rest of the day. We're not going to point the gun at anything. We're not willing to destroy. I think of this as like the laser rule. Okay, so what I want to envision is that there's a white hot laser beam coming out of the muzzle of that gun, and anything that I sweep it past, it's going to cut in half. Okay, so that means in general, my safe directions are either going to be straight up or straight down. Okay. Once we're out on the range and we have a down range, that can also be a safe direction. But, you know, a lot of times you'll see guys, you know, particularly working in like formations and stacks and things like that, and they've got that muzzle out at a 45 degree angle, pack, pointed at the back of their buddy's thigh or back or whatever. We want to have that muzzle depressed all the way down to where it's pointed in a safe direction, okay? 
<clears throat> and a lot of that is just situational awareness, knowing where people are around you, knowing where places are around you, things like that, okay? <clears throat> and then finally, we wanna be aware of our target, what's beyond it, and then also what's to the foreground and flanks. So 360 degrees around that target we need to be aware of. Um, once we get out to the range today, we're gonna have a nice big earthen berm and hill back there that we're gonna be shooting into. So it's not gonna be a question that that is a safe direction. Um, but even that being said, we gotta be cognizant of who's to our left, who's to our right, are they gonna cross into our field of fire, right? Um, particularly with the rifle, take it easy, man. Uh, particularly with the rifle, we really need to know that, um, we need to know where that bullet is gonna stop. Okay, um, I see a lot, particularly in this area, folks, that they will go out and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll put their target up on a tree on the wood line and they're shooting that 5.56 five, into that tree and you got bullets zinging all through the woods and whatever. You got to have some kind of positive backstop that is going to stop that bullet. Okay, um, you know, we got a 5.56 five, five, round that's traveling roughly 2,600 feet per second. It will literally go for miles. Okay, if it's unimpeded before it just falls out of the sky, all right? Um, and it still has some terminal velocity capability at that distance, okay? Um, now, obviously, I don't want to shoot somebody with it at 2,000 yards because it doesn't have great terminal velocity at that distance, but it's still going to hurt somebody, okay? Um, you know, we've had instances here in St. Mary's County where our SWAT team, you know, they're out doing sniper training on a farm and ended up putting a 308 bullet into a neighborhood, okay? So... Again, your resume does not safeguard you from doing stupid shit, okay? Um, so again, just to kind of bring it back around and check everybody's ego, even though you might've been shooting since you were a small kid or you've been doing a lot of hunting or you're very familiar with a rifle, we all have to kind of check ourselves, look at the situation that we're putting ourselves in in terms of where we're practicing, what we're doing and say, hey, is this really a good idea? And if you have any doubt whatsoever, put your stuff back in the truck and go home, okay? Um, you know, again, this location that we're gonna be shooting at today, we've shot there many times. It's got a good earthen berm backstop. We'll be shooting into targets. So from that aspect, we'll be good to go. But again, once we get out there, just be very cognizant of where your muzzle's pointed, where your finger's out on the trigger, and obviously I'm gonna be there to remind you, okay? Um, this is Rich in the back here. He's gonna be helping me out with uh, doing range officer duties. So if he comes up, you know, gives you a correction, that kind of stuff, be cognizant of that and just kind of go with the flow. Can I borrow you real quick? You would just kind of stand here and face that direction. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one of the things that we do um, when we're out on the line, range officer might come up and they might, uh, right, so go ahead and give me a little air gun here. So if, uh, if he's here, if Kenny's here, and say his muzzle is starting to get a little too, off, too far off to one side, typically what we'll do is we're gonna come around and we're gonna grab the muzzle of that gun, or not the muzzle, but the fore end, and probably like your elbow, and we're just gonna kind of redirect you back into a safe direction, okay? You go sit down. <clears throat> now, I'm not one of these guys that's gonna like tackle you on the range or yell at you or anything like that. Now, I might yell to be heard, but I'm not gonna yell at you, okay? Um, if we, give you a correction or we kind of take control of your weapon, steer it in another, another uh, direction. Don't take that as some kind of personal insult. Don't be offended. Don't get your ego involved um, because what we're looking at is from our perspective. And if from our perspective, we think there's a safety issue, we have to make sure that everybody's safe on the range. That's our responsibility, okay? That's what part of what you're paying us money for, okay? Um, so again, just kind of check your ego at the door. I check mine at the door. It could very well be that I'm wrong. If you want to have a conversation about it, we can have it after the class or on a break or whatever. In that moment, just kind of go with the flow and be like, okay, no problem. I'm going to do what you tell me. I'm going to finish my drill and then we'll go on to the next one. Okay. Um, it is a reality that, you know, we all occasionally get a little brain locked and make stupid mistakes. And, you know, we're here to make sure that doesn't happen for you. And likewise, you guys are all range officers as well today. So if you observe an unsafe condition, anybody can call ceasefire, ceasefire on the line and everybody's gonna stop shooting, okay? And we'll go over that more in depth when we get out the range as well, okay? Anybody have any questions as far as safety right now? Nope, okay. Um, 
once we get out to the range, again, I'm gonna go over our, whole, our entire medical plan in detail, so I'm not gonna to get too deep into it right now. Uh, if per chance we were to have an accident here in a classroom, obviously all these guns have been checked, there should be no live ammo in here. Um, we do have a medical kit that's right here in my black bag. Um, so we would treat in place, and thankfully we're in a you know, fire department, so hopefully somebody's got some medical training to help us out. Do any of you guys have any medical training at all? The CPR? Okay. All right. In general, what we're gonna do, apply direct pressure. I've got hemostatics, I have tourniquets, I have chest seals. So we're gonna treat for trauma. Um, cell phone coverage is pretty good around here, so we're gonna dial 911 and wait for an ambulance to respond to our location, okay? Right now, we're in the Solomon's uh, firehouse. When we get out to the range, I will make sure everybody has the address out there. So if somebody does have to call 911, um, you'll have an address. And then also, um, if you do happen to be the person that's talking to the 911 operator, you want to tell them there's been a firearms training accident. We don't want to say there's been a shooting because if you tell them there's been a shooting, we're going to get cops instead of an ambulance and we need an ambulance first. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what do you guys think are some of the reasons why we would want a carbine for say defensive purposes as opposed to a handgun? Okay. It's a good point. Bales, any thoughts, any suggestions? I know we got one more. So those are all good points. So the main thing behind why we would want a carbine as opposed to a handgun, we've got some ballistic superiority there, okay? So even with, say, your nine millimeter handgun, you're shooting, you know, 155 grain bullet, um, or 115 grain bullet, rather, um, you know, 124 or something like that, moving, you know, 12, 1500 feet per second. With this, you know, we've got anywhere from a 55 grain bullet up to about a 77 grain bullet, and we're pushing it at like 2600 feet per second. Okay, so even though it's a smaller bullet, it's moving a hell of a lot faster and we're getting a lot more ballistic transfer there as far as energy is concerned, okay. Um, we've got a lot more ammunition on board, okay. So even your biggest handgun with the smallest ammo and the largest magazine, you're probably looking at, you know, 21 or so rounds. I mean, you can get big stick mags and stuff like that. With the, the standard capacity magazine for the AR, we've got 30 rounds on board. Okay, right there on the gun. Okay. Um, obviously, we can, depending on our context, we can carry multiple magazines, we can get bigger magazines, stuff like that. The AR-15 uh, is a very reliable platform. I know there's been a lot of kind of talk and internet trollery about the reliability of this particular gun. Yes, when it was introduced in Vietnam, there were some reliability issues due to you know, poor maintenance, some of the manufacturing practices, things like that. Um, Vietnam was a long time ago, gentlemen. <laughs> um, you know, this gun's been through, you know, two decade or more long shooting wars at this point. Um, typically, what, what you see in terms of reliability or when there's questions about the capability of the 5.56 round, it has to do with the government making adjustments to the gun in terms of barrel length and then not adjusting the ammunition accordingly, okay? So I kind of got off on a little tangent there, but if you're matching the barrel length to the round, which we'll talk about, the gun is very, very much lethal. The ammunition is very much effective. Um, in terms of reliability and maintenance, my experience with this gun has been that it will run, it runs just fine dirty, um, but it doesn't run well dry, okay? <clears throat> You know, particularly in like dry, sandy environments, you got to have some lubrication on the gun. Now, that said, you don't want oil dripping out of it because that's going to just gather more dirt. But if that gun is kind of slick to the touch and you can see that there's oil on that bolt carrier group, it's going to continue to function. Um, my AR that I teach classes with has probably got several thousand rounds through it right now between cleanings with nothing more than a, a punch through the bore and uh, add an additional oil. Okay, 
So you can get this going really nasty and it will still run, okay? <clears throat> it's relatively easy to keep running. Uh, what I mean by that is, say in the defensive context, we're using this to defend our property, defend our home, what have you. Um, a lot of people fall back on the, the kind of tried and true, oh, well, I want a pump action shotgun for home defense. Well, what happens when your wife or your grandmother or whoever or you get excited and you short shock that shotgun, okay? Now you have a problem that is very difficult to solve, okay? If I have a malfunction with this AR, it's very easy to use a tap rack reassess and get that gun back in the fight, okay? So I can keep it running a lot easier relative to other platforms, okay? Um, the gun is very versatile, the AR M16 platform. <clears throat> it's very modular. So if I wanna do mainly a close quarter battle type roll, I can get a 10 point or a, yeah, 10 .3 inch barrel, you know, put a suppressor on it, throw a red dot on there, and now I've got a very capable gun for CQB work, okay? If I want to go out and do, uh, you know, more of a precision rifle roll with like an SPR, uh, special purpose rifle, you know, I'll hang a 20 inch, 24 inch stainless steel barrel on it, use the same lower receiver, throw a magnified optic on there, and now I have something that I can reach out and get some, you know, some better distance with, okay? Um, if I want a general purpose rifle, you know, 16 inch gun, 14.5 pinned mid-length gas system, um, great general purpose gun that I can use in different roles, okay? Um, accessories, kind of a double-edged sword with accessories. Uh, the good thing is you can get just about anything you would want to bolt onto this rifle, okay? The bad part of that is, frankly, some of those accessories are trash, okay? Um, a lot of the stuff is just useless in concept. Uh, a lot more of it is that you've got, you know, different manufacturers that have, have made items of lesser quality, okay? Um, a lot of times people think, oh yeah, it's just a chunk of aluminum or it's this or it's that, um, you know, I got a tube on there with a red dot, they're all the same, right? No, not so much. Um, typically with your accessories, my rule of thumb is anything that I'm gonna put on that gun needs to earn its place on the gun, okay? Um, I'm not just gonna throw something on there because I think it looks cool or, um, you know, so-and-so on the internet said that it was a good thing to have, okay? It's gotta earn its place. Typically for my carbine setups that I'm not running night vision on, all I want on there is a really high quality white light, some sort of optic, um, and a sling. That's really about it, okay? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about setup as we go, but typically I like to keep the guns as stripped down as possible. Um, you know, when we get into talking about night vision, that's where we need to be cognizant of like IR lights, lasers, things like that, and we start putting a little bit more on a gun. If you can afford suppressors, it's not a terrible thing to have, but it's not truly necessary either, okay? Any questions up to this point? Nope, all right, cool. All right, so let's get into nomenclature a little bit. So. We're gonna start from, I'm gonna use Ryan's gun here. I flew out from Utah yesterday, so I didn't bring any guns with me. Um, so we're gonna start from the muzzle end of the rifle and work our way back to the butt end, okay? So the muzzle is gonna be the end where the bullets come out of, okay? Typically we have some kind of muzzle device. This is uh, an A2 flash hider. Um, this would also be if you're running suppressed guns where your interface is for that, okay? whether it's just threaded onto the barrel, or you've got some kind of like adapter, like a Surefire or something to that effect. Your barrel runs from, sometimes they're exposed, sometimes they're underneath the handguard like yours. Um, it's gonna run from here all the way back to the chamber. Um, you're gonna have a gas tube on top. So most of your guns are gonna be direct impingement gas systems, okay? Which basically means as that bullet passes through, it's gonna force gas back here that forces the bolt to the rear. Okay, and we're gonna talk more in depth about the, the operation of the weapon itself. Um, this particular gun has what's called an A-frame on it where our front sight is housed. Okay, you can see the front sight nested down there between those two little wings. Some of your guns, if it's a free float barrel, are not gonna have that. Um, this is gonna be the front end where the, um, 
four end mounts up. You got that delta ring here in the back, or your delta rings back here. Um, four end, you're typically going to have some kind of guard here. Some of you guys are running quad rails, some of you are running M lock. Um, so, what I'm referring to there is if I can borrow your gun, mm -hmm. <clears throat> typically on your fore end, you're going to have some type of mounting system here to attach accessories to. Is this one M lock or is it uh, key mod? M lock. M lock, okay. So, initially, what happened is you had something more this style with your M16A2s and things like that, where you just had a uh, a fore end that mounted to the front and to the back, and that's pretty much all you were going to get. Okay. Um, over time, we figured out the advantage of having free floated rails, so that the uh, barrel is sitting in that free floated handguard and it's not touching anything. When you actually fire that gun, the muzzle sort of whips, or the barrel rather, kind of has a whip motion to it. We call it barrel harmonics. So the fewer things that are in contact with that barrel, the better and the more accuracy you're gonna get out of it as a general rule, okay? So on your free float hand guards, the cool thing was now we can mount all these accessories. So initially what we had were quad rails, which I believe, Tim, you got a quad rail on your gun, right? All right, so <clears throat> this is what's called a quad rail. So we have rail sections, 1913 rail, that runs on all four sides of the clock face. So we would have like 12, three, nine, and six, right? So we can mount all our accessories directly to that rail, okay? Now the disadvantage of the quad rail is, is it heavy, okay? Um, and then it's got that cheese grater texture to it that over time can kind of wear your hands out. So <clears throat> the evolution of firearm, eventually we got to the point where we switched over to, uh, you know, again, modifying that free float rail, we decided, well, now I don't really want a full quad rail where there's rail sections that I'm not using. I want to just be able to bolt on rail. Okay, um, we can get into the utility of having a full auto gun or a three round burst gun. Three round burst, honestly, just kind of sucks. It's not good for much. Um, full auto guns have certain applications, but you know, again, for most of what we're doing in a civilian context, um, you don't really need it. Okay, it's it's a cool thing to have. Um, you know, when we're talking about like vehicle operations and things like that, and disabling vehicles, full auto is a nice thing to have. But aside from that you're honestly just better off running the trigger on semi-automatic, okay? Okay, so we've got, this is an A2 uh, buttstock. So it's fixed, it's not adjustable. Most of you guys are gonna have some variation of an adjustable buttstock like this one, okay? Where you can adjust it out like so, okay? Nice thing for this is that you can adjust it for length of pull for you. So if you've got short stubby arms, you can adjust it down a little bit. If we're wearing body armor or heavier clothing, we might want to adjust it down just a touch. Okay. Um, for the most part though, my rule of thumb is I want to run this stock as long as I can get it. Okay. Um, I don't want to be soaked up here like this. All right. I want to be farther out away from the receiver. Okay. Right. And we're going to get into technique and that kind of stuff later. Okay. Um, on the opposite side of the gun, we have your bolt stop. So you get your ping pong paddle there. I call it that because it looks exactly like a ping pong paddle. Um, that's going to be your, your bolt catch bolt release. Okay. So if I want to release the bolt and let it go forward, again, verifying it's clear, I'm going to hit that guy there. Okay, and obviously I'm not left-handed, but I don't want to point my gun that direction. So, okay, so that's your bolt stop, bolt release. If I want to lock it to the rear, I'm going to pin that thing to the, on the bottom there, pull this back, and we're going to lock it, okay? So it's called a stop and release because it serves both functions, okay? Um, your gun. Slings. Typically our slings are gonna be mounted at the rear and at the front. Um, you know, a lot of your fore ends nowadays have places where you can plug that quick detach into. Uh, likewise with your butt stocks, that's a good thing to have. Uh, you can run all, a whole myriad of accessories as to how to attach those slings. Now, I will say this, I have seen numerous quick detach mounts pop off. Okay, they, they get old, 
You don't get them in there all the way. They get a little worn out. Typically, you've got steel going into aluminum, and that that adapter is going to widen out over time. And I've seen guys go to pick their gun up, and it just falls on the ground. Okay. <clears throat> so over time, I've kind of gotten away from the quick detach, or you really just want to kind of give them a solid tug when you put them back in there to make sure that they are firmly attached. Um, again, there's tons and tons and tons of ways that you can attach them, but the more robust, the better. Okay. Any questions about nomenclature at all? Nope. All right. Press on. All right. How many of you guys got iron sights on your gun? Pretty much everybody. You have backups on that? You got offsets, right? Okay. All right. So one of the things with our iron sights that uh, has garnered a lot of confusion over the years is do we want to have the large aperture up or the small aperture? So what I mean by that, typically on most of your rear sights, you're going to have this little flip up aperture, okay, like that. I don't know if you guys can see that in the back or not. I don't know how everybody's rifles are configured, so I just want to make sure that we're all aware. So we've got this aperture that flips either forward or back, all right? Got it? Yeah. Go ahead on yours. All right, you got both. Okay. So the funny thing about this and the reason why there's so much confusion is the Navy and the Marine Corps have one set of procedures that they use for which aperture you're supposed to have, and the Army and the Air Force use a different one. Okay, you'll find that a lot with this particular gun is that the, you know, sort of the Navy thinks of it one way and the Army thinks of it another way. Okay, and then yeah, the Marines will be insulted by me saying this, but he, typically the Marine Corps is going to follow suit with the Navy and the Air Force is going to follow suit with the Army, okay, or vice versa. <clears throat> so the way that I've sort of broken this down, the military kind of breaks it down by distance. Um, and like I said, depending on what service you're in, it could be different. So I've broken it down to the lowest common denominator and more in terms of kind of the functional reality of what you're going to be using that site for, okay? So my general rule of thumb is that large aperture, I want that for situations where I'm going to be shooting relatively quick and relatively close, okay? So if I'm doing CQB applications where I need to get the gun up, get a good, get a sight picture and get rounds down range, I want to have that larger aperture, okay? And what that allows me to do is see more of my front sight and index it quicker, okay? The military also talks about low light, fog, you know, basically any time where your vision is occluded, you want to have the bigger aperture, okay? The small aperture, when I want to do really tight, precise shooting or I'm shooting at distance of any kind, I want to have that small aperture up, okay? Now, where this really comes into play and screws people up is when you're zeroing your gun, okay? Um, I, I worked with a certain a certain organization and they absolutely insisted that everybody had to zero with their large aperture. What that large aperture does is it allows more room for error in the alignment of that front sight. Okay, if I've got a hole this big and I'm trying to align that front sight post, there's more room for my eye to get it aligned incorrectly. Okay, whereas if I've got a small aperture and the post, now I, I've, I've got a lesser margin for error, right? Does that make sense? So what these guys were trying to do is they were trying to shoot with this large aperture and trying to get a zero, and they spent like three hours trying to get zeros on guns because they're just they're chasing groups all over the place. Okay, um, as soon as we switched to the small, and I, I I tried talking to their instructor, I'm like, dude, you're having so many problems because you're shooting with the large aperture. Have them switch to the small one. No, no, that's not how we do it here. Okay, no problem. So the next time I went out and worked with that particular organization, I said, hey, dude, give me a half an hour. Let us, let's do it with a small aperture and let's just see what happens. And if, it, if we're not done in a half an hour, I will never talk to you about this aperture thing again. They switched to the small aperture and everybody was zeroed inside 20 minutes, okay? So just remember, if you're trying to shoot a precise group or you're trying to shoot at distance, put the small aperture up. For general, general shooting, we're trying to shoot close and quick, we want the larger aperture. If I'm staging a rifle for defensive use, 
I stage it with the large aperture up, okay? Because typically I'm gonna have a, my typical kind of quote unquote civilian engagement with a carbine is probably gonna be closer, it's probably gonna be faster. Um, and if this target is at a further distance from me, well now I have a little bit more time to change apertures if I need to, okay? If I stage it with a small aperture and I need to switch it, probably not gonna work out so well, okay? Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about, I think my video is dead here, is the cycle of operations of the weapon itself. Let's see if this video works. Yep. Okay, what, what I'll do is we'll kind of explain it, we'll walk through it, and I'll have you watch the video again, and it'll probably make it more sense the second time, okay? So firing, all right. If we start from the firing point, what we have is we've got a magazine loaded, we've got a round in the chamber, okay? The bolt is forward and locked into position, okay? When we pull that trigger, it's gonna cause that hammer to go up, strike the firing pin. Firing pin is gonna strike the primer. That's gonna cause the powder to ignite and it's gonna push that bullet down the barrel, okay? So that is my firing sequence. So what happens as that bullet pushes that gas out of the barrel, it's gonna run through the gas tube back here, and then it's gonna interface with the bolt, okay? Up on top of your bolt is your gas carrier, okay? It forces that gas into the gas carrier, and then it pushes the whole bolt to the rear, okay? As it does that, your bolt face is gonna unlock, so it actually rotates to allow the bolt, the bolt to um, come free of the chamber, okay? So if you look at the inside of your gun, I'm gonna pop this guy apart. There's the bolt forward. Okay, so if, if we look at the front end of our chamber, or our, excuse me, our bolt, we've got this nice star-shaped bolt face here, and that locks in with the barrel extension back here where you've got that star-shaped chamber, right? Okay. And like I said, that bolt actually rotates and keeps that locked in there, okay? So as that bolt pushes back, the bolt is gonna rotate, and we call that our unlocking, unlocking phase, okay? Let's get a chance to see it. So that star-shaped chamber is gonna meet up with the star shape on the bolt, okay? So as the bolt extends, you can see that it's, this is in the compressed position, so if, the bolt, if it was chambered here, it would be locked in, okay? And then as it comes out, it actually rotates, okay? So that's where the unlocking comes in. And then that's gonna push the bolt backward, all right? And then we have our extractor claw, which is hanging on to the base of that cartridge. And as it comes out, it's gonna extract. And then this little guy right here is called our ejector, this little button, okay? So the extractor claw is holding that case in place, and then the ejector is gonna push on it, and that's what's gonna cause that round to eject from our ejection port, okay? It's an ejector right there, okay? Okay, so the ejection is gonna kick that empty brass out of the side of the gun, okay? And then as the bolt pushes back across the hammer, okay, it's gonna go from the forward position here and it's gonna push it back into the locked position, okay? So that's what's gonna reset our trigger for us, okay? <clears throat> So that's what we call cocking, is when that hammer gets pushed back, okay? And then that whole cycle starts over again because the bolt is gonna push back here against the buffer here, okay? And then once it reaches its mechanical extension, it's gonna go back forward and it's going to hit that first round that's at the top of the magazine and force it into the chamber. And then the bolt is gonna compress again and it's gonna lock into place in the barrel extension. Okay, so firing, 
unlocking, extraction, ejection, cocking when the hammer goes back. We're going to hit that full extension in the, in the buffer tube. It's going to push it back forward. We're going to feed the next round. It's going to chamber, and then it's going to lock, and then the firing sequence is ready to start over again. So let's watch that video one more time, and hopefully in context it will make a little bit more sense. All right. Any questions about the cycle of operation? Anybody a little fuzzy on it? Nope. Okay. Good deal. So why do you think we need to know about the cycle of operation? Right. So if something interrupts that cycle of operation, we're going to get what's, what's called a malfunction. Okay. And we need to be able to know how to correct that and get the gun back into the fight. Okay. So if we know how the gun works, we can extrapolate out from there how to fix it, okay? And we're gonna get into that in, in ad nauseum later on. So it's the top of the hour right now. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break and come back in here at nine o'clock. Um, so grab some water, you know, use the bathroom, whatever. Somebody will be in here at all times with your guns, so feel free to step out. We won't steal your crap, promise. I'm gonna go out to the car real quick and grab some water. You need anything? All right, cool. So what I want you guys to do, go ahead and, and pick up your gun, verify that the chamber is in fact empty. Okay, we cleared all the guns before we came in. There shouldn't be any live ammo in a classroom. But any time that we go to maintain or break down the gun, we wanna make sure there's no magazine in there. So the magazine well is empty. We wanna physically Look down in that chamber and verify there's no round in there. Okay. Once you're at that step, go ahead and put hit your uh, bolt release, let the bolt go forward. Okay. All right. Then what I want you to do, the way I like to uh, disassemble these guns is I like to let gravity do some of my work for me. So I will turn the gun upside down, put it down on the table like so. Okay. And then you have a front takedown pin and a rear takedown pin. All I want you to do is pop out that rear takedown pin. Okay. And if you can get your front out, go ahead and pop that one off as well. And then go ahead and separate your upper and your lower receivers like so. So for right now, let's go ahead and set the lower receiver aside. Okay. <clears throat> we'll deal with that in just a second. So I don't have cleaning, cleaning supplies with me. Like I said, I flew in, so I didn't bring a whole lot of extra junk. Um, but I'm going to kind of talk you through the cleaning procedure on this gun, and we're going to talk about some of the parts, some of the things that you want to look for in terms of um, inspection to make sure that the gun is not imminently going to break on you and to keep everything running. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is just go ahead and you hook your charging handle like so. Give it a little pull, okay? And then we're gonna take that bolt carrier and just slide it right on out, okay? So this guy right here collectively with your bolt carrier and your bolt carrier group and your gas key is referred, or excuse me, your bolt carrier, your bolt, and the gas key are collectively referred to as the bolt carrier group, okay? So take your bolt carrier group, set that aside with your lower receiver, okay? And then we can go ahead and take that charging handle. Now the charging handle runs in that groove along the top of the upper receiver, okay? And there's a little, 
little uh, set of double half moons up here, that little cutout right there. You see that? These guys right here, see where that light's shining? See those two little cutouts? So those two little cutouts screw a lot of people up when it comes to the AR, because essentially you can't pull that charging handle out like this, all right? You gotta put a little bit of upward pressure on it and then pop it out like that, because you've got these two little protuberances there on either side of the charging handle, and that's what lines up with those two cutouts. Okay, so typically what happens is people will slide that thing back and forth. They can't find the cutout. They can't get the charging handle out. So go ahead and take your charging handle, set that aside as well. Okay. A um, couple things we forgot about earlier, or I forgot about on nomenclature. Your Ford Assist is right here, that little button. And what that Ford Assist does, if you look down in your receiver, it sends this little Paul Ford, and it should, if you've got a military carrier, these little cuts right here, that pawl engages with those cuts and it will push your bolt into full battery, okay? So if the bolt is going into the chamber like that and it's not quite all the way forward, which happens sometimes with certain manipulations, and we wanna get it all the way into battery, we're gonna hit that Ford Assist and that's gonna push it up there, okay? Um, one of the things that I like to do whenever I load my gun is I'll do a press check. I'll teach you how to do that on the range, but because the bolt is not pulled all the way back to full extension, sometimes it doesn't go all the way back into battery. So I tap that Ford Assist a couple times, okay? Okay, so if we look down in here, you can see the back end of your gas tube is sticking out right here, that little silver guy right here, okay? I'm gonna turn the light off on me. <laughs> And then, like I said, you can see where that barrel extension is and you've got that star shape right there before your chamber, okay? That's where the bolt locks into, okay? So in terms of maintenance, the very first thing that I wanna do when I get this thing taken apart, if I have some kind of barrel solvent, is I wanna go ahead and get a, a wet patch and I'm gonna go ahead and push that through the barrel with my rod, okay? Um, some folks are using pull through like an Otis cleaning kit or some sort of flexible rod. That's totally fine. The general principle is I always want to clean from the chamber end to the muzzle end, not from the muzzle to the chamber. So I'm not jamming my rod down the muzzle of the gun. I'm pushing it from the chamber end out. Okay. Now, the other thing I see a lot of guys do is they'll pull, pull dirty patches back through the gun. Take the dirty patch off at this end. That way you're not dragging all the crap that you just cleaned out back in the barrel. Okay. <clears throat> you know, same thing with the flexible cleaning kits. One thing that I really do not care for is in terms of cleaning is uh, boar snakes. A lot of guys use them, but there's no way to clean the thing in between cycles, right? So, um, and, and even the guys that I know that use them, they don't typically wash them. So you're taking all this lead and uh, powder fouling and all this stuff, and it's building up on this boar snake, and you're just dragging the same dirt back and forth through the barrel, okay? Um, I just don't, I don't get it. So you either want some sort of flexible cleaning kit like an Otis, uh, there's a couple other quality ones on the market, or you want a decent rod, okay? Um, with your rods, it's not a bad idea to have one that's coated with something, so you're not running bare steel against uh, the chrome lining in your barrel, or if you're running a stainless steel barrel, you definitely want to have a, a, a coated rod of some type, right? Um, so again, as a general rule, the very first thing I want to do, I want to run a couple wet patches down that barrel and what that allows that to do is your solvent will sit in there and it will start to dissolve all that powder fouling, okay? Um, talk about cleaning products real quick. Typically, there's three things that I want. I want a solvent, I want a lubricant, and I want some sort of preservative, okay? The solvent is what I'm actually gonna put into the barrel to break up the carbon fouling, lead fouling, that kind of stuff, okay? Um, brass deposits. The Lubricant is what I actually want to put on the moving parts. Anywhere there's a bearing surface where metal is touching metal, just like in your car, I wanna have some type of oil on that, okay? And then the preservative is what I'm gonna put generally on all the metal parts and a little light coat on the outside of the gun just to prevent rust, okay? Most of these guns with modern coatings, they don't rust a whole hell of a lot anyway, but it's not a bad idea to have a little something on the outside. What I see particularly with beginning shooters 
is that they confuse those three, three products, okay? They're using a preservative as a lubricant, they're using a lubricant as a solvent, and those three things are designed for three different functions, okay? Now you will have what's called CLPs out there that are a cleaner lubricant and preservative. What I've found with CLPs is they do, they do all three of those jobs suboptimally, okay? Um, that's not to say for an AR or a handgun, you can get away with a CLP. When you start to get into like precision rifles and things like that, you wanna have three different products for three different functions. Is that not clear? Um, as far as um, a lubricant, you can use motor oil, you know, use a synthetic motor oil. Um, you can use purpose-built products. It really doesn't matter so long as you've got something in the gun to keep it wet, okay? Uh, like I said, the AR, uh, it run, it'll run just fine dirty, but it will not run well dry, okay? <clears throat> All right, so that's the first step of my cleaning process. I want to get some solvent in that barrel, and then I'm going to go ahead and set that aside, okay? Um, at that point, typically what I'll move to next is my bolt carrier group, okay? So for our bolt carriers, if you guys have newer guns, I don't know if you're going to want to break them all the way down or not. Uh, sometimes these cotter keys are a little bit difficult to get back in. So you can take it all the way down or not, depending on whether or not you think you're going to be able to get it back together, okay? Um, you've got your firing pin retaining pin right here. Everybody can see that. All right, so typically what you can do is you can take your fingernail and you can work under there and go ahead and pop that firing pin retaining pin out like so. Set that guy aside. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to turn that bolt carrier group upside down, give it a little tap. Oh, let's get the step there. Hang on. Yeah, okay. This one's just dirty. Okay, so I'm going to give it that little tap and my firing pin should fall out. <coughs> okay, and then we've got this, this guy right here, and we're going to turn that to the side like that. It's going to rotate. Okay. So we're taking this, and we're turning it this way, like so. Your bolt carrier should be about the same. Yeah. Let's make sure that's turned to the side. You already got it. So this dude right here needs to be turned this way. Like that. Okay. Yep. See, it's got to it's got to be depressed or it won't turn. Okay. If it's in this position, it's not going to turn at all. So you got to have it depressed to the rear and then turn this direction so it's parallel. Okay. So this guy right here is going to be pushed back, and then it'll start in that position, and then it'll be like that, okay? <clears throat> like I said, guys, if this guy is, if this is sitting at a 90 degree angle, you can pull on that all day and it's not going to come out, okay? It's got to be, the bolt has got to be depressed, and we've got to turn it parallel, and then you should be able to pull that out, like so, okay? And you can see that this pin has a hole in it, that hole is where your firing pin passes through, okay? So until the firing pin's out, that pin's not gonna come out either, okay? And at that point, we should just be able to pull the bolt right out of the front of the bolt carrier group, okay? All right, so we'll start with, let's take a look at our bolt. So go ahead and pick that up. There's a pin right here at the back of your extractor. So rotate this thing around until you get to the short extension on that star there, and that should be where your extractor's at right here. Okay, this guy right here, extractor, see? Extractor right here, see how this one's shorter than the other ones? Bam, right there. So you got him right here. So you can see how this one's shorter than the others, and that's where your extractor's at, okay? So what I'll typically do is I'll take my firing pin, come to the rear of that extractor, and you wanna put a little bit of downward pressure with your thumb, 
and you can push that extractor pin right out and then pull it out. You gotta keep a little downward pressure and then you can pull it out the opposite side. Okay, like so. Set that aside and then your extractor should come right off. Okay. So for end user maintenance, where the gun is at right now, these parts, I don't break it any further down than that. Okay. Um, technically per Colt, um, who, you know, they, they do most of the armor schools for the AR-15. Um, an end user should not be breaking the gun down any further than that. Uh, and again, a lot of this is organizational training, so they don't want, you know, Joe infantrymen or Joe patrolmen pulling the uh, trigger mechanism out of the gun and then not being able to get it back together, right? So for general everyday cleaning, this is as far down as we want to break it, okay? So typically what I like to do while that barrel is soaking is I'll go ahead and I will clean all this stuff. Uh, and we'll start with the smallest parts first. What I'll do is I'll just have a soft bristle brush. I don't ever use a metal brush or a copper brush, uh, just soft plastic. A, a, a new toothbrush is totally fine. I'm going to get some solvent, and I just want to get all of the carbon fouling off all these metal parts. But what I'm doing while I'm doing that is I'm also inspecting all of these parts. Okay, So I want to look for any kind of, um, any kind of uh, cracking, any, anything of that nature on all the metal parts. With my extractor, I want to make sure that that little indentation at the end of that extractor claw, where it hooks into the, uh, the base of my cartridge. So if you, if you hold it up, you can see it's got a little hook on the end of it, right? I want to make sure that that little hook is nice and sharp. So when I run my finger across it, I can feel it kind of scratching my skin. Okay, because if that starts to get rounded or it's chipped out or whatever, it's not going to grab that cartridge rim and it's not going to kick that cartridge out the way it's supposed to. Okay. On the opposite end of that extractor, I should have a little spring back here and that spring should have a little like rubber donut around it. Depending on who manufactured your gun, you may or may not have that. And what I also like to see is there's a little piece of plastic inside that spring as well, a little piece of rubber. Okay. So right here, you should have a little bit of rubber on the inside and then that donut that goes around it. Okay. Okay. Sorry about the lighting in here, guys. I know it's not super excellent. So you're gonna have a little rubber piece inside, and then you got the little donut that goes around it. Okay. So typically you'll have that little rubber piece there, and then you got the donut that circles around that extractor spring. Okay, so the purpose behind that rubber insert there and then you got the donut around it okay rubber insert there and you got the donut that goes around there okay you might it looks like you don't have the donut around it's not a big deal so the purpose behind these and having that redundancy there is if that extractor spring breaks those two little pieces of rubber will still give you a certain amount of springiness and it will keep your extractor working even if the springs broken okay um, that was one of the things that they found kind of Vietnam era is those springs were pretty delicate and they will break occasionally and they weren't getting reliable extraction without having that, that rubber insert in there. So first the donut thing came in and then the, the insert. Um, some of these are color coded differently depending on what kind of gas system that you have. Um, you can do some research on Google and figure out kind of which one goes in your particular gun um, or look in your... Um, your guide for your gun and figure out what the manufacturer recommendation is okay or you can buy the parts straight from the manufacturer okay um it was not all that uncommon probably five ten years ago to see um, civilian guns on the civilian market from like smith and wesson ruger companies like that where they were pushing out a lot of these 16 inch patrol length ars and they didn't have any inserts in at all okay over time, the quality of those guns has gone up quite a bit, particularly like with Smith. Um, and you're seeing those kind of small, fine details a little bit more. But if you buy an older gun, that's one of the things that you want to look for. It's a cheap upgrade, so it's not like a deal breaker if you're going to get a good deal on the gun. But I would just make sure that you buy those inserts and put them in. Okay. Um, when we're looking at the bolt itself, a couple of things you really want to pay attention to. Powder fouling will definitely cake up 
on the back of this bolt tail, okay, this little shoulder right here. So typically what you're going to need is some kind of scraper to get that off. That's where I will go kind of metal on metal. I don't use a metal brush, but I'll use like a, a, a dental pick works really well to really pick that stuff off and it'll come off in like flakes. Okay. I want to make sure that that's a smooth metal surface when I clean this thing. Okay. So this shoulder right here at the back of the bolt tail. Okay. If moving up a little bit, these, uh, little metallic rings here those are your gas rings there should be three of them on there and if you look you can see that there's a gap in each of those gas rings okay now the old wives tale was that if you line the gas rings up there's gaps that the gun wouldn't function it's not really true <laughs> see where the gaps are out here okay um, what you do want to pay attention to though is these gas rings will wear, will wear out over time so if they're like falling off or they're cracked or whatever you can I typically have uh, gas rings on hand to replace them if I see some that are broken when I'm pulling my rifles apart. <clears throat> Again, it's just a cheap part and it's something that wears out, so it's a good thing to have on hand. Okay. <clears throat> the rest of the bolt itself, we wanna make sure that that's clean. Um, the extractor up front, or ejector rather, that little button that we pointed out, you just wanna push down on that and make sure there's some spring tension to it. Okay. It should feel pretty stiff. Okay, if it's not, you probably need a new ejector spring. Just want to give that guy right there a push. It should have a little stiffness to it. There, like that. Okay, then the other thing that we want to pay attention to is these locking lugs on that bolt. Okay, the, this is another area that will crack quite frequently. So if that's damaged at all, you're just gonna have to get rid of the whole bolt. Okay, it's, you're not gonna be able to replace it. It's, once it's damaged, it's damaged. Um, you, the gun will still run with one of those broken off, but obviously we don't wanna do that for very long, right? So if we can catch it ahead of time before it causes some kind of catastrophic failure, we definitely wanna do that. That's why we're doing the whole inspection process. <clears throat> And then we just want to make sure that that bolt face is nice and clean. The other part here is we've got our um, firing pin hole right in the bolt face. Okay, that's that hole right in the center. That's where the firing pin extends through, and you can see it poking out there. Okay. So we want to make sure that that's nice and round. It's not damaged. We want to make sure that that firing pin is not extending any farther than it should be. Sometimes over time, the, the firing pin impact in the back of that bolt face will actually push that out and it'll start to crack, okay? Especially if we're doing a lot of dry fire with a gun in particular, okay? And again, that's something if it's, if it's starting to chip out, you're just gonna have to get a new bolt. <coughs> All right, so let's set the bolt aside and then we'll pick up the firing pin itself, okay? Um, this surface right here, right on this shoulder, will build up a lot of fouling. And it's another one of those spots where you're gonna to wanna to take a dental pick and just kind of pick it off, it'll flake off. Okay, and this stuff doesn't have to be like absolutely spotless. Okay, despite popular belief in the military, it will still function. Okay, but the main thing that we wanna look for with the, the firing pin is the front of that firing pin should be slightly rounded. Okay, almost like the end of a ballpoint pin. We wanna have that same sort of rounded um, contour to it. If it's sharp or pointed, we don't want that, okay? Because that's gonna penetrate that primer in ways that we don't want, okay? Should be nice and rounded. All right, and then the other thing that we wanna look for is any kind of cracks. A lot of times I've seen firing pins crack right around this little shoulder right here, and we don't want that either, okay? Again, if you see a crack in it, it's time to throw the firing pin out and go to another one. This is another item that I like to have spares on hand. Okay. Okay. These other small pins and stuff, I clean them. Uh, you know, again, I don't. I want to make sure they're not cracked. Cotter keys. Sometimes they'll get a little bit of, a little bit too spread out. They're hard to get back in the gun. It pays to have. It's also the the most typically lost piece of the gun. So I want to make sure that I've got some extra ones of those on hand as well. OK, 
Okay. Then let's look at the bolt carrier group itself. Okay. The, if you take your bolt and you kind of insert it in there, there's a little shoulder where the bolt tail meets up back here and that gathers a lot of carbon in it right back in here. So if you can look at it from this end, it's probably, probably everybody's are pretty gunked up. If you look right down in there. Okay. That's one of those areas I really want to get my brush down in there, clean that. I want to get some patches down there, scrape that stuff out as best I can. The rest of it, I'm just going to uh, hit down with a brush. The other area that I want to pay a lot of attention to is my gas carrier key, this part up here. All right. So if that carrier key goes down, your, your direct impingement gas gun is, is not going to work anymore. <laughs> okay. So a couple of things that I like to look at, and I'll show you guys as I come around. The two screws that are here, you should have what's called staking on either side of those screws to make sure that the screws stay in. So I want to grab that thing and I want to kind of try to twist it. Um, and if it moves, I've got a problem. I need to tighten those screws down and restake them. Okay. Torque it should not move at all. What's up? Is there a torque rating for those? Yeah. So if you go to, you can find it on the internet. I'm not sure exactly what the torque rating is, but like Colt will tell you. It's probably like maybe 15, 20 pounds uh, per square inch, something like that. Okay. And this, you can see the staking right here on either side. You always want to make sure that that key is staked in. Okay. So again, we just want to give that guy a little shake, make sure it's on there tight. You can see these little indentations holding that screw in. That's your staking. Okay, this is another thing where if you're buying uh, maybe a little bit more cost-effective gun, uh, particularly from five or ten years ago, a lot of companies were not staking their gas keys in. So that's one thing that I always want to inspect when I'm buying a new gun to make sure it is staked. Now, you can do this by hand with a punch and a hammer. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be nearly as pretty as that but it can be done on the cheap. You just want to make sure you're moving enough metal there to make sure that screw is not going to back out. Okay. Again, most of your manufacturers now have caught on to this stuff and they're starting to do it. But initially, um, you know, when you were first starting to see a lot of open more people were, the market was trying to catch up with the AR demand and a lot of these little steps were being missed. Okay. Okay. So we'll set all that aside. Um, as far as our charging handle goes, Again, you just want to make sure that nothing's cracked. You want to make sure there's some spring tension on that latch and you're good to go. Okay, not nothing too complicated there. As far as cleaning goes, just wipe the powder fouling off of it. Okay, and then let's move on to our lower receiver. Okay, <clears throat> so a couple things with our lower receiver. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll take my charging handle, just depress that little detent there and that's going to allow your bolt carrier and your bolt carrier spring to come out. Okay, Just kind of finagle it out there. This one's a rifle length. All right, and then we should be able to actually separate that spring from the bolt carrier. Okay. All right, so as far as my carrier goes, if I give it a little shake, okay, I should have a little rattle in there, that's fine. Um, you wanna make sure that your bolt carrier is matched to the gas system length that you have. Buffer, right? Buffer, I'm sorry, not, yeah, thank you. So the buffer, excuse me, um, you wanna make sure that the buffer is matched to your gas system. Okay, so if I have a rifle length gas system, I want to have a rifle buffer, carbine length, mid length, so on and so forth, right? Um, you can do a little Google, a little Google foo, and you should be able to match those, particularly like if you're building a gun out. If you're getting it from the factory, chances are it's matched up as it should be anyway, okay? Next thing I want to do is I want to take a look at that buffer spring, okay? Um, on this guy, what I want to do is I'll take it and I'll roll it across the table, okay? and it should roll pretty straight, okay? If it's rolling in a circle or it's kind of cattywampus, like this one is just a little bit off. So see how it's got that little wobble in it? That tells me that I've got a bend in that spring somewhere, which is not really a big deal unless it's like really off. <clears throat> and then I probably want to replace my spring, okay? 
As far as cleaning these, again, just hit them down with some solvent and then wipe them off. Not, not real complicated. Okay. Um, as far as the receiver itself, when you're cleaning your trigger mechanism and stuff, I will put a little bit of solvent on there and brush out what I can see in terms of car carbon fouling. Maybe you take a little bit of compressed air and blow down in there and just get any kind of gunk out. I don't want to put tons and tons of solvent down in there and lubricant because it's hard for me to get it back out without pulling the trigger out. Okay, and like I said, for end user maintenance, you want to be, don't want to be taking the trigger out all the time. Okay, the other thing that I want to be cognizant of is I want to make sure the safety is always on when I have the uh, receivers separated because if I have it on fire and I pull the trigger, and don't do this, just watch me do it. I want to put my finger in front of that hammer and let the hammer down easy. Because what I have here is I've got a steel hammer and I have an aluminum receiver. So if I let that hammer fly forward into that receiver repeatedly, it's going to crack my receiver. They we're putting a little bit of Loctite on that guy, okay, because they will back off. Same thing when you're mounting optics and that kind of stuff. <coughs> I'll typically use blue Loctite and I've never had any problem getting it back off. So. Okay, so that's a, honestly about it for your lower receiver. So what we'll do um, at that point, I will go ahead and put, well, let, let's talk through the upper receiver first, then we'll put everything back together. So when I do my upper receiver, what I'll do at this point is I'll go, I'll put, uh, put some solvent on my brush. I'll run that brush up and down two or three times, and then I want to start running I'll run one more wet patch and then I'll run dry patches through the barrel until it comes out relatively clean, okay? Again, with a carbine or a handgun, I'm not a stickler about having perfectly white patches come out of the gun. Um, frankly, I think a lot of guys clean their guns way too much, um, you know, because essentially what you're doing, you're running, you're running a rod down that barrel, you're taking everything apart, you're causing wear that you really don't need to be causing. Now that said, if I'm using a gun for home defense or a duty gun, I wanna have the gun clean, okay? I don't wanna have it dirty because I'm already starting from a deficit. Um, but I'm not one of these guys that's gonna break my gun every down, down every month and reclean a clean gun. Okay? It just, it's silly, it's a waste of time. Um, so when I take it to the range, when I bring it back, now if it's a range gun and that's all I'm using it for is training or whatever, Honestly, on an AR, I'll go several hundred or a thousand or more rounds in between cleanings. Um, but again, that's for a training gun that I'm not going to be putting into a duty use or a home defense type use. Um, so if you're taking your home defense gun out, you know, shoot it, clean it, put it back together. Okay. So what we're going to talk about now is reassembly. So let's do it in reverse this time and we'll go ahead and start with the lower receiver. So you just want to go ahead and take that buffer spring. Work that guy back down in there. Set the buffer on top. You might have to push the hammer down just a little bit to get it to go past. And then you're gonna push that down in there until it slips over that detent and then the detent will hold it in by itself. Here we got Cool, cool. All right. So at that point, we're gonna go ahead and set our lower receiver aside. Go ahead and take our upper receiver. And like I said, I like to do, I like to let gravity help me out here. So I want to turn that guy upside down. So if I've got a carrying handle or an optic, it's facing downward. And then we're going to take that charging handle. This is the trickiest part for most folks. You'll find out here in just a second. He's already finding out. <laughs> All right. So what we want to do is you've got those two little wings that are sticking out, right? Okay. Set those wings on the top of that uh, indentation there and just go ahead and push it in. And when it hits that, those cutouts, it's gonna drop down on its own. That's what I mean by letting gravity do the work for you. Okay. And then it'll sit right down in there like that. Once it hits those wings, push it forward about a half an inch and then leave it. Okay. And then we can go ahead and start putting our bolt back together. So first thing you wanna do is take your extractor, go ahead and push that back down and depress that spring. And then you can take your, um, that extractor pin, go ahead and push that in. It's only gonna go in from one side. And then I'll take the back of my firing pin and just go ahead and push it over until it sits flush. Like so, yeah.
Actually, if you got it, hidden. No, you're fine, man. We're good. Thank you. Okay, so once we've got that bolt put back together, we're going to go ahead, pick that bolt carrier group up, hold it upright like this with the gas key facing up. All right, and go ahead and push it down in there. And then the cool thing about this guy, when you go to put the pin back in, it's only going to go in one way. So if the extractor is facing the wrong direction, it's, the pin is not going to go back in it. Okay, so you want to rotate it this way. All right. And then you can go ahead and put that pin in. Now the pin has got to be parallel. So up and down this way when you insert it, or again, it's not going to go in. Okay. And if it doesn't work one direction, then turn the bolt around the other way and it should slip right in. Okay. Okay, so then once you've got that in there, go ahead and turn that key or that pin to where it's sitting <clears throat> perpendicular to the bolt, like so. All right, so go ahead and push it. Yeah, there you go. So then you want to take that guy. Yep, and then go ahead and put that in there. Like I said, it will only go in one way, so if it won't go in that way, then rotate the bolt around the opposite direction. Yeah. See what we got there. So this that hole is chamfered on one side, but not on the other. So if you turn it this way, yeah, it'll work for, typically it'll work from the other side. Okay. There you go. So it's going to sit in like that, and then we want to turn it to where it's perpendicular rather than parallel okay because that hole is through that pin and if it's facing that way the firing pin won't go in you got to turn it that way and then the firing pin will go down so again letting gravity do our work for us with this pin sitting perpendicular to the bolt we're going to flip this guy upside down and we're just going to set our pin right in here like this and what you can do if you set this down on the table you can put your whole hand around the bolt and just drop it in and it should line up Okay. If not, you can kind of finagle it in there a little bit. Okay. And then the firing pin should drop all the way down, like so. Okay. Then once you have that, you're going to put that firing pin retaining pin back in, like so, and our bolt will be back together. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do, everybody got their gun back together? Um, before we put this thing back into service, we want to function check it to make sure everything is working properly, okay? So I want you just guys to observe this once and then we'll walk through it together and then I'll let you practice it a couple times, okay? So once we've got the gun back together, the bolt is going to be forward. So again, I just like to do a little extra check. Again, I, you know, I don't know whether the, the magical bullet fairy is going to come by and put ammo in my gun. But habitually, anytime I'm manipulating a trigger, I want to make sure the chamber's clear, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to pull the charging handle to the rear, okay? We're going to let it go forward, all right? Then I'm going to put the gun on fire, okay? And then I'm going to pull the trigger straight to the rear, and I'm going to hold it, okay? So we should hear a click, all right? Again, I'm holding that trigger to the rear with my finger, and I'm going to cycle the charging handle again. Okay, that is effectively resetting or cocking that hammer, okay, just like we talked about in our cycle of operation. Okay, and then I'm gonna let my finger out and I should hear that trigger reset right there. Okay, so that tells me that the bolt is functioning properly and that the trigger is functioning properly on the gun. Okay, and then I can pull that trigger again and I should get that click. Okay, bolt to the rear. So I'm going to reset, I'm going to let it out, and hear the click, okay? And then, again, what I've, if I'm putting the gun back into duty use, I'm just going to cycle it one more time, put it back on safe, okay? And then I'm going to put it in whatever condition I'm going to store it in. 
if I'm storing the gun long term, I know I'm not going to be shooting it for a while. I put it on fire, pull the trigger, okay, and that way all of the springs and mechanisms are in the relaxed position as opposed to of the compressed position when I'm storing it. Now that being said, if I'm going on duty or whatever and I want the gun to be ready, um, say I'm going to put it in like a cruiser ready condition where the chamber is empty but I want to insert a magazine in it, at that point I just want to have the trigger mechanism active. So I'm going to have it on safe, um, you know, triggers lives ready to go and then I'll just insert a magazine in it. That way when I get out of my patrol car or I'm going on, you know, a, a field patrol or whatever, I'll rack around and put it back on safe and now the gun's ready to go. Okay. Uh, again, there's a lot of debate on how you should store the gun in your home for defensive use. Uh, you know, I'm happy to have that conversation with you, but a lot of that's going to be contingent on what you want to do with the gun and what condition you want to have it in, what your um, comfort level is with safety, kids in the house, all that kind of stuff, right? It's highly individual. Okay. So again, with the function check, if you guys want to follow along with me this time, just go and pick your guns up. Uh, you can rest the muzzle on the table, just kind of like we have here, put it off to the side, just make sure it's not pointed at anybody, okay? So again, starting, we're just gonna double check to make sure that that chamber is empty, okay? I'm gonna pull that charging handle to the rear and then let it go forward, okay? Put the gun on fire, okay? Finger on the trigger, I'm gonna pull it straight to the rear, all right, and then I'm gonna hold it. So pinning the trigger to the rear, I'm going to cycle the charging handle again, okay? All right, now we're going to let our finger out until we hear that click, okay? At that point, we verified that the gun's good to go, okay? All right, and then we should be able to put it back on safe, okay? All right, so now what I want you guys to do is go ahead, break the gun all the way back down, um, you don't have to pull the bolts out because we've got a couple guys with sticky cotter keys, okay? So break it all the way down to the component parts with the, the bolt out, okay? Um, or the bolt carrier out, rather. And then once you have it all taken apart, let me know, and then we'll have you put it all back together, and then we'll function check it, okay? Barrel length, like we talked about with the AR, you know, you've got barrel lengths all the way from like nine inches all the way out to, you know, 20, 24 inches, okay? Um, the amount of barrel that you have and the twist ratio in that barrel is gonna have a big difference on the, uh, it's gonna have a big impact on the ballistics of that round or the ballistic performance of the round, okay? So barrel length, the twist ratio. Um, if you guys look at your guns, let's see, somebody's actually got an exposed barrel here. Um, Okay, so you got a one and nine. Well, that's a good question. How many of you guys know what your twist ratio is on your gun? Okay. So typically it's going to be stamped on the barrel here. Um, this one is a one and nine. This gentleman's got a one and nine. It should be right on the top of the barrel. Right here. This lighting sucks. one and eight okay so if it's not stamped on your barrel it should be somewhere in the manufacturing information on your gun you should be able to look it up but one of the things that you want to be familiar with is what that twist ratio is now when we're talking about twist ratio what that refers to is how many times that that bullet is revol is um, revolving okay within uh, one inch or excuse me let me, let me make my crap straight here. So the barrel twist ratio, you can look, um, before we get into that, we'll talk about lands and grooves. So if you check out, okay, if you check this out, this diagram right here, you have raised sections within the barrel. Those are called your lands. And then the depressed section is the grooves, okay? Um, the way those are cut into your barrel is what determines the twist ratio. So for a one in seven twist, for example, you're gonna get one full revolution of the bullet for every seven inches of barrel length, okay? For a one in eight, you're gonna get one full revolution for every eight inches of barrel length, okay? So on and so forth, okay? Our typical barrel lengths or barrel twist ratios are gonna be one in seven, one in eight, one in nine, um, and sometimes you'll hit a one in 12. I've seen one in 14s as well. Um, so typically, 
the, the shorter that twist ratio is, the faster that that bullet is gonna be spinning, okay? Um, does it really matter? Is one necessarily better than the other? It really, it, it's one of those, it depends situations. It depends on what your application is, what your barrel length is. What you really need to know this for though is to, to match the ammunition that you're gonna shoot to the twist ratio in your gun, okay? Because as we'll see on the next slide, some of the twist ratios do a better job of stabilizing certain weight bullets than others, okay? Like I talked about before, um, a lot of the um, kind of talk you get out of military circles about, oh, the 5.56 five, five, is an ineffective round is because they were mismatching barrel length to the wrong ammunition, okay? So, for instance, when they made the switch in certain units to like a 10.3 inch barrel, and they're still running like 55 grain bullets, that's where you start to run into problems. And that round is less effective than it should be. I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't wanna get shot with it either way, but you know, you wanna maximize the bullet weight to the twist ratio. This little chart here is also in your handout, and it kind of shows you what twist ratios will stabilize what bullets most effectively. Um, so you see there's a couple in the middle that all do pretty well. Um, your 62 grains and your 55s. Uh, your one and eights do a good job of stabilizing the 75s and the 77s along with like your one and seven. But this little Venn diagram is probably the best resource that I've seen as to where to get all that information in one spot and see it effectively. So what you guys wanna figure out, I saw a lot of one and nine twists. So you guys can get away with even a lighter bullet like a 50 grain, 45s, 40s. Um, but you can also push a little bit heavier with the 62s and 55s. One in seven is where, where most of your military um, rifles are, like the M4, or the M16, um, 75 grain, 77s. Like I said, though, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the 62 grain and the 55 grain bullet. So a lot of times what I'll do is if I'm stocking up on ammo, if I want to have several thousand rounds of ammunition stockpiled, I'm gonna to try to shoot for a 62 or a 55 grain bullet because I could use it in a wider range of guns, okay? Um, the best way to find out what your rifle likes is to try some different weight bullets and just see what group's the best. You know, shoot some 100 yard groups and just find out you might have a gun. And you know, while this diagram is useful, I wouldn't say it's 100% for every gun. Um, you know, I've had guns that on paper should have stabilized a 77 grain bullet a lot better, and it just wasn't the case. You know, they like the 55 or 62, all right? So bottom line with that is just be cognizant of what your twist ratio is. Have a resource like this. It's all commonly available on the internet, and just make sure that when you're buying ammunition, you're being cognizant of what your tw twist ratio is, okay? So external ballistics, um, again, that's everything that's happening from the end of the muzzle all the way out to the target. These are some general numbers for an M4 style carbine. So we're looking at a 60, 16 inch barrel, 62 grain M855 round. Your muzzle velocity, so that's the, the amount of energy that's being transferred at the muzzle is about 2,900 feet per second. Um, excuse me, muzzle velocity would actually be the speed. So you're 2,900 feet per second. Muzzle energy, uh, that's, so that's foot pounds of energy, is a little about 1,200. Uh, maximum range, 3,500 meters-ish. Okay, so that's basically, that maximum range is where that bullet is actually gonna go terminal and it's gonna fall out of the sky under its own power, okay? 1,760 is a mile, okay? So you're pushing that over a mile, almost two miles. Okay, if we shot it on a, a straight level plane where there was no obstruction, that's how far that bullet can go under its own power. So the key takeaway for that is, again, it goes back to that safety aspect. We got to have a backstop that's actually going to stop that bullet and keep it right there. Okay, um, like I said, I've run into a lot of instances in the past, particularly in this area, where people will go out, they'll tack, you know, tack a... a a target up on a tree or a cardboard box or something like that and you got bullets going all over hell and back okay make sure you've got an effective backstop that's actually going to stop that bullet okay um, max effective range for an m4 16 inch about 500 yards um, 
I've shot 16 inch guns with a four power optic out to 600. You can definitely do it. Um, this gun is capable of an awful lot is the bottom line. Okay. Okay. So one of the biggest questions that comes up when we talk about external ballistics on these rifles is where should you zero? Okay. Um, so to go back to this other slide here, you can see when that bullet is coming out and into that muzzle, it's not taking a straight line to the target, which is what most people kind of think or perceive. The bullet's actually coming out and it's getting a little bit of rise and it's traveling in an arc. Okay. So the top of that arc is what we call the maximum ordinate. Okay. Um, and then you've got the terminus point here where it impacts or where it would kind of fall out of the sky under its own power, okay? Um, but the, the key takeaway from that is if I zero, say at 50 yards, it's gonna cross that point there and then on the back end of that arc, it's gonna intersect again. So the reason that I would wanna select a specific zero is I wanna know that I have a zero here and I have a zero out here, okay? And then in between, I need to know either my hold under or my hold over to get to get that bullet to hit where I want it to, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So trajectories for those, um, like for a 25 yard zero, wish I had my clicker with me. So yeah, for like a 50, I'm gonna have it cross here at the 50 yard line, and then it's gonna cross again out here closer to 200 yards. Generally, what I like to do is I'll, I will zero at 50 yards typically. Really, it comes down to what ranges you have available to you. I know a lot of law enforcement agencies will zero at a 25. Not, you know, not a, not a big deal. You just need to know exactly what the holdovers are for your gun. Okay. And this, uh, this bank of charts over here, it's lined out so it shows you for 25, a 50, and a 100 meter zero exactly where your point of aim, point of impact is at, okay? I'm just gonna try to enlarge that a little bit for you, but it's not, not working out so well. There we go. That's what I was looking for, okay. So you can see with a 25 meter zero, your 25 and your 350, so that's the front of the arc and the back of the arc are gonna be roughly in the same spot, okay? Um, at 400, I'm gonna have to hold a little low. 100 to 300, I'm gonna be holding a little bit high. 150 and 200, I'm gonna be holding a little high because that's at the top of the arc versus the bottom of the arc, okay? 50 meter zero, one of the reasons that I like it is you've got a lot of ranges right here that are all roughly center mass. So if you look at the A zone of this target, which would be kind of like the necktie region of a human being, I've got my 150, my 100, my 200, my 50, and my 250 are all right here. And then at 300 yards, I need to hold right around the belt buckle or the navel, okay? And then 350, I gotta hold a little bit lower than that, all right? Whereas if I'm running a 25 meter zero, that's an awful lot of different holds that I gotta memorize to get that bullet to go where I want it. Okay, 100 meter zero, again, is a good zero, but a lot of people don't have ready access to 100 meter range. Okay, make sense? All right. Again, the key takeaway, just like with the twist ratio, know your rifle and know what your holds are. The only way to confirm this is to go out and actually shoot it, okay? And ultimately, what you would like to be able to do is be comfortable enough to where you can assess the range of that target and you automatically know where that hold is, okay? 
again, with the 50 and the 100 meter zero, I tend to favor that because it takes a lot of the memorization and the guesswork out of where the hold should be. And it puts much, many more of the holds right there in that center mass area for me. So if I'm a little high or a little low, I'm still probably getting a good combat effective hit that's at least gonna put meat on metal and have some kind of effect on that target. Okay. All right, so let's talk about external ballistics a little bit. Um, when we're selecting optics, a lot of times what you'll hear is the term MOA or a minute of angle. Okay, so really what that is, a minute of angle is broken out into 360 degrees and then it's segmented. Okay, so one degree is 60 minutes, 360 degrees is um, 2100 or 2000, 21,600 minutes of angle. Okay, so what that really translate to, translates to for most marksmen is that one inch at 100 yards is one minute of angle, okay? As you go further back, that ratio stays the same. So at 200 yards, it's two inches. At 300 yards, it's three inches. When you get about to, after about 600, it starts to change a little bit. But for what we're doing with the carbine, you figure um, one inch at 100, two at two, three at three, so on and so forth, okay? Um, so the reason that you need to know that is you need to know the adjustments on your particular gun, okay? I've got a little chart down here at the bottom that shows you a lot of your common um, optics. So we've got our vortex spark, the aim point. We have iron sights for M16, A A1, A2 style irons. And basically what that tells you is that for, so for our front sight elevation, for instance, one click on the uh, M16A2 front sight post at 100 equals um, 5 sixteenths, or I'll just typically round it up to a quarter inch because it makes the math a little bit easier. So that's gonna adjust that. If I'm zeroing the gun at 100, it's gonna adjust that a quarter inch, okay? And again, it just comes back to being familiar with, with your rifle and knowing exactly what the graduations are on your particular sighting system and being able to adjust it, okay? If I'm at 50 yards, I'm gonna double that and it'll put me at half an inch, okay? When you guys leave here, if you email me, I think my contact information is in this PowerPoint. If you email me, I will send you this file electronically so you can zoom it in, print it out, take the charts out, put them on you know, a different sheet of paper or whatever. It makes life a little bit easier for you. <clears throat> Any questions about internal or external ballistics before we press on? Nope, all right. Okay, so the next thing that we wanna talk about is terminal ballistics, and that's stuff that actually happens inside the body uh, once that bullet makes an impact, okay? So again, to go back to the very beginning, we talked about having a ballistic advantage with this gun, and this is where it really starts to shine over a handgun, for instance, okay? Um, taking a look at this diagram here, with a handgun, typically what you're gonna see is you're gonna see basically a straight line is what the wound channel is gonna look like. So what we're looking at here, just to break this picture down and explain it a little bit better, let me blow that up. I don't know why this thing's so far out of focus. Okay. So what we've got here, from where the bullet enters to where the bullet exits, this is what's referred to as our wound channel, okay? When, you're, when the bullet actually passes through, the channel of the bullet itself, the, the, the narrow diameter of that bullet is what's referred to as our permanent wound channel, okay? And then the, what'll happen is that bullet, as the bullet travels through, you get an effect that's called hydrostatic shock. So the more energy transfer What's going to happen is it pushes all that tissue out around it because your body is mostly made up of water. It's hydrostatic, right? So the bullet pushes through. You get the hydrostatic shock effect that pushes all the organs, flesh, muscle, tissue out away from it. Okay, and then as the bullet passes by, it'll collapse back down. 
on uh, high speed photography with um, ballistic gelatin. and you can kind of see that. I'm sure you guys have all seen it on YouTube where the bullet passes through, you get this wave and then it kind of collapses back down as the bullet passes and you get kind of like this ripple effect, right? So that's exactly what it's doing in soft tissue as well. You get in the big temporary wound channel as that hydrostatic shock passes out and then it collapses back down to the permanent wound channel, but it's still causing uh, damage to the tissue and the organs and things of that nature, right? Um, and then as it passes through, once we get to the end, all of that hydrostatic shock is following the path of that bullet and it continues with the bullet, okay, as it goes out. So it's basically following it so when you get meat and all that other kind of stuff coming out of the back end of an exit wound, so your, your entry wound is typically fairly small and your exit wound is really big, um, that's what we call cavitation, okay? So that hydrostatic shock is following that bullet out and you get that cavitation effect, okay? When that's in, inside of a pressurized container like your skull, that's why we have skulls that depressurize and explode and do all that kind of cool shit, right? So... Again, permanent wound channel is typically about the diameter of the bullet. Temporary wound channel is much larger. It collapses back down, and then we're going to have cavitation on the exit. Now, when you compare a rifle round to a handgun round, the handgun round, the um, hydrostatic shock effect is much less because you typically have a heavier bullet that's moving a lot slower. So you're going to have a much, you're going to have the same permanent wound channel but a much narrower temporary wound channel, so it's not expanding out as much. The speed of the bullet through the rifle is what's really causing that hydrostatic effect. Okay, make sense? So the rule of thumb here is that if we can go into a confrontation with a long gun versus a handgun, we always wanna to default to the long gun if at all possible, okay? So I can tell you from firsthand experience, I've seen a lot of gunshot injuries and I've been to a fair number of autopsies. Um, and you can definitely tell when you talk to your, uh, like your ER docs and folks that are doing your autopsies, they can't really tell the difference from one handgun round to the next. I mean, they can tell a small caliber from a larger caliber, but if you went to them and said, hey, is that a 45 or a 357 SIG or a 38, if, unless the bullet's present, they're probably not gonna be able to tell you. Um, you can immediately visually identify the difference between a handgun round of any type and a rifle round of any type because the tissue damage is just absolutely devastating. <clears throat> Shotguns, um, you, there you're still dealing with a fairly slow moving bullet, um, you know, particularly with like slugs, but it's really big. Okay? So you're getting a lot of energy transfer versus a handgun. Okay? Okay, so now that we understand a little bit about all the ballistics, we wanna talk about how to apply that in terms of shot placement, okay? So I break this down into two categories. We got switches and we have timers, okay? Anybody wanna hazard a guess as to why we term it that way? Okay, so a timer, okay? Just like an egg timer, we're gonna set it for a certain amount of time and it's gonna count down, okay? So the human body Think of it like this, it's essentially, um, it's essentially a hydraulic system, okay? You got a pump, it's pumping fluid out to different parts of the body, it's keeping things running, right? So if we poke holes in that system somewhere and we start letting blood out and air in, we've now just messed up that hydraulic system, okay? But it takes time to depressurize, okay? Um, so there's basically two ways that we can stop a human being, okay? One of them is exsanguination, where we just let as much blood out of the body as possible until there's a loss of blood pressure sufficient to stop that action, okay? That's what we refer to as a timer, okay? We don't know how long it's gonna take them to bleed out. It could be anywhere from seconds to minutes to hours, okay, depending on where our shot placement is at. Um, if we keep things in the center mass of the body, that's where that pump is at, that's where our lungs are, there's all kinds of things that we can affect there that are, are gonna be to good effect for our purpose, right? Um, a timer on the other, or excuse me, a switch on the other hand is just like a light switch. Flip it on, flip it off, okay? The human body has some switches, okay? And they're mainly associated with our brain, um, the base of our spinal column, uh, and our spinal cord itself, okay? 
all those central nerves, central nervous system things that are critical to the structure, if we can hit those and affect them, we get what's called flaccid paralysis, where the body just shuts down and it goes limp, okay? Uh, particularly when we're doing like, um, you know, in, in my former career, we did like hostage rescue stuff and things like that. There's certain scenarios where if somebody has a gun to somebody's head or they have like a dead man, um, like a switch for an explosive device or something like that, you want to achieve that flaccid paralysis effect so they can't pull a trigger or hit a switch. And we have to be very cognizant that, that we get that good shot placement. Okay, so in order to get that, we have to affect the medulla um, or the cervical spine. So like the, um, I believe it's the seventh cervical vertebrae that sits right at the base of your neck. Okay, or we have to sever the spinal cord itself. Or we have to get both lobes of the brain, like if we're sideways like this. Okay, if I were to shoot somebody and I only get one lobe of the brain, I get a lot of spare electrical impulses. If you can disrupt both, okay, so if I'm uh, to imagine like somebody's hat band, all right, if I hit in the center of the head right in that hat band region and I can get both lobes of the brain at once, I can still get that flaccid paralysis effect. <clears throat> if I want to get it from the front, what I want to do is I want to hit what's called the T zone. So essentially we're drawing a box around the eyes, okay, and then we're coming down into the nasal cavity just a bit. That's going to get us into that medulla and the back of that cervical vertebrae. Okay, sits right back here. Okay, so, so you can get the medulla, cervical vertebrae, right there. Okay. Now, part of the reason that we want to hit in that ocular cavity, okay, is because that's where the skull is already compromised and it's the most soft. Uh, particularly with handgun rounds, I've seen instances where they hit off to the side one way or the other and that bullet will follow the line of the skull under the skin and it'll stop, okay? Um, our skulls are very hard bone. Now with a rifle, not quite as much of an issue, particularly if you're getting it square, um, but with a handgun, we definitely wanna get in that ocular cavity, okay? <clears throat> okay. So going back to the, uh, the timers, okay? If you look at, where you've got the, the most mass of heart, vessels, veins, all this kind of stuff branching off from the body. A lot of that stuff sits right on the center line of the body. You've got this massive artery that follows the spine here, and then it branches off down here at the iliac, okay, right in the pelvic girdle, okay? So one of the things that we wanna think about is keeping all those bullets center mass of body, okay? The one, the, uh, to back up a step, one of the reasons that we don't want to always default to targeting the head is the head is very mobile, okay? It's on a hinge, I, move, I can move it back and forth. Um, if I have uh, hits on other parts of my body, I, I'll a lot of times I'll tend to tuck my head in, okay? And it's a smaller target. So it's small and it's more mobile. So for general purpose defensive shooting where we don't have some kind of hostage scenario or some sort of other factor where we need that headshot, we want to keep things center mass because that's going to be the easiest for us to hit and it's going to be the least mobile, okay? Even if I turn my body away or I tuck in or whatever, you can still generally identify where center mass is at, okay? Um, now, a term that I like to use is center of available mass. So if, for instance, I'm behind partial cover and we're engaged in some kind of gunfight, right? If I'm back here, okay, John, you can see my center mass right now, right? Right here. How about now? Okay. How about now? Not really. Okay. But you can still see part of my body. And if you can get rounds on that part of my body, that's going to affect my thinking and my ability to engage you. And it might cause me to expose myself to the point where you can get rounds into my center mass. Okay. So target the center of whatever it is that you can see. Okay. <clears throat> and then make more appropriate follow-up shots from there, okay? Um, I like to refer to that as the necktie region. So if, if a, a man was wearing a necktie, anywhere that that necktie is gonna hang right there in that center line, if we can bullet, get bullets in there, there's plenty of things that are gonna pump blood out or have an expect, uh, effect on like spinal column. All those goodies are right there in that center line area, okay? Um, shot dispersion is something we wanna talk about. 
So if I stack bullets one on top of the other, nice and tight, you know, like I want to do in like a match or something like that, and I've got those bullets sitting right on top of each other or, you know, less than a hand span apart, the body effectively recognizes that as one injury, okay? Um, if I can space those rounds out a little bit more, the body at that point is going to recognize, okay, I got something going on here, I got something going on here, I got something going on here, I need to address all that stuff, right? Now that said, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to deliberately di disperse the shots so much that we're not in that effective zone anymore. But honestly, for uh, combative style shooting, I don't really care too much about having my groups any tighter than about a hand span apart. Okay. Um, if I'm wider than a hand span apart, I'm probably not using effective trigger control and I'm probably shooting a little too fast. Uh, and I'm at risk of putting them outside of that necktie zone. Um, if I'm shooting any tighter than that, I'm, not pro I'm probably not shooting as fast as I could be. Okay? I want to get as many rounds on target as quickly as possible because the more holes I poke in that person, the quicker they're going to exsanguinate and that's going to stop the threat. Okay? In a defensive shooting, that's all we're trying to do. We're not trying to shoot to kill. We're trying to shoot to stop whatever action they were performing that caused us to shoot them to begin with. Okay? Um, looking at it from a legal perspective, that's also a sound principle, okay? Um, how many of you guys have concealed carry permits? Most of you, a couple. Okay, so the legal principle for constitutional use of force is you're authorized to use deadly force to um, stop someone from delivering death or serious bodily harm to another, okay, or yourself, okay? Um, so that's predicated on you observing their action, being able to read that action as likely resulting in your death or death and serious bodily harm to somebody else, okay? So when they stop performing that action because they're no longer capable, we no longer have a legal right to shoot them, okay? So that's where you kind of tie the legal part into the, the ballistics part where you aim. It's all kind of interrelated, okay? Um, we want to have the, the maximum effect on target as quickly as possible so we can stop that threat, bottom line. Where's my pointer at? Okay, so the next thing that we want to talk about, well, tell you, do you guys have any questions about any of the ballistics, any of the anatomy stuff before we go on? All right, cool. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to talk about is selection and setup for our particular purpose. Um, and this kind of ties together all the things that we've talked about up to this point. You guys have a pretty wide variety of guns in here, but they're all kind of in the 16 inch, 18 inch range, which is pretty typical, I think, for you know most folks. They want, a, they want a gun that's quote unquote street legal. Um, so that puts you into the 16 inch or a, you know, a 4.5 pin gun. Um, so the first thing that we really want to think about when it comes to selection and setup is what are you planning on doing with it, okay? Like I said, if I want to go out and take six, seven, eight hundred yard shots, I might want to do a 24 inch barrel with a magnified optic, okay? Um, if that is not the case um, and I want to focus on more of a home defense, close quarter battle type role, I can probably get by with a 16 inch or shorter gun with a red dot of some type on it, okay? Um, I can get a lot of work done with iron sights for defensive purposes, okay? Um, gas systems are something that we want to talk about. Um, generally speaking, the longer that gas system is, the more um, user-friendly the recoil impulse is going to be. So if I'm shooting a rifle-length carbine, I'm going to get a lot less... Um, kind of a lot less recoil impulse out of that rifle than I am a carbine length gas system. I personally like a mid-length gas system on most of my guns um, for exactly that reason. They just have a, a, a little bit softer recoil impulse, which is, it's not that I care about getting beat up by the recoil, but what it does is it puts less motion on my sights, okay, and it allows me to get quicker shot to shot recovery, okay. Um, lights are a great thing to have on your gun. The one thing, and again, tying it back to the legal realm, the one thing that we have to do before we can shoot a target is we have to have the legal justification. In order to do that, we have to actually be able to see what the hell's going on and we have to be able to positively identify the target. 
Um, there's tons of cases out there where people have shot loved ones or family members coming back into the house late, you know, shot their teenage kids trying to sneak back through a window. You need to know what the hell you're shooting at. Okay, and in order to do that, if it's dark, we gotta have a light on the gun, right? It's very hard to manipulate this gun with a flashlight in the opposite hand. You can certainly do it, but having a light mounted on the gun makes things a lot easier, okay? One thing you do need to be cognizant of though, even though you have a flashlight mounted on the gun, that doesn't turn your gun into a flashlight, okay? What I mean by that is, I, and I see this with cops a lot, uh, particularly with handgun mounted lights, they will point a handgun at somebody just for illumination when they don't really have a legal right to be pointing a gun at them, okay? So if, if you need a handheld light and a weapon mounted light, that's the best combination to have available to you, okay? Um, slings, we definitely wanna have a sling on the rifle. Um, the analogy I use, the sling to the carbine or the rifle is basically what the holster is to the handgun, okay? I wanna have a way to store that gun on my body where it's in a relaxed position and I don't necessarily have to have my hands on it, okay? That does not alleviate the need for me to know where that muzzle's pointed at all times, okay? Uh, one of the things that I see a lot, particularly in military tactical community, I see guys sling their rifle on their back, which again, is not a terrible thing in and of itself, but the gun, the muzzle is pointed off this way or off that way or at their feet or whatever, particularly if you're um, handcuffing and searching or rendering medical aid you still gotta know where that muzzle's pointed, okay? These safeties are relatively easy to get disengaged on your gear and stuff like that. So I always wanna know where that muzzle's pointed, okay? <clears throat> optics, you guys have a variety of optics. Like here, we've got a fixed, I think that's a four or six power ACOG. You got an LPVO or a low power variable optic. Um, we got some red dot sights. We got some irons. So we got a good, good cross section in the class. Um, Irons are our basic starting point. I'm, I'm kind of a believer that every rifle should have a, a set of backup irons on it. Um, guys go back and forth. Um, your LPVOs and your RDSs uh, have become very reliable. So I do know guys that do not run a backup set of sights. Um, my personal philosophy is I've seen guns get damaged, okay? Um, more often I've seen guys that forget to turn the red dot on or the, the batteries go dead. Uh, you know, I've seen photographs and things like that from the military where guys have caught rounds in their optic. If you can set that optic up on a quick detach where you can flip those QDs and then just take it off, I think that's a really good solution. And then you can just run backup irons. Um, on one of my primary rifles, what I actually have is I have backup irons on the gun that I can't even deploy with the optic on it. But if that optic were to get damaged, I can, um, I can hit those QDs, take the whole scope off and discard it, flip those sights up, and now I have a, a, a gun that is still combat effective, right? Um, but again, your mileage may vary. I like irons on everything personally. Um, the good thing about irons, they don't run out of batteries. Um, they're super reliable and they're super durable, okay? Um, getting into the red dot sites, um, any of your quality red dots have the advantage of um, they're very quick to acquire. They, you kind of get that visual pop where you can quickly find the site, quickly align it to a target. Um, the nice thing too is with a red dot site, you're not lining up a front and a rear, so you don't have to worry so much about that alignment. You're superimposing one thing over the target. And as long as your holdover is right, you're pulling the trigger. Okay, most of your red dot sights are also parallax free, which means that you don't have to be directly behind the gun. You can be at a slight offset. So in other words, if, um, say this cell phone is my RDS window, okay? And the tip of this pin is my red dot, okay? I don't have to have that red dot centered in the window and then superimpose over my target. My red dot could be over here and as long as it's superimposed over the target, I'm still gonna get my hit on a parallax free optic, okay? <clears throat> now with, um, with some of your, your magnified optics, your low power variables, those are not necessarily parallax free. So you still have to have that red dot roughly centered in the tube and then superimpose over your target, okay? Um, one of the things that I like with magnifier, or excuse me, with uh, red dot sights now is you can put a magnifier behind it 
and have it on a, um, what am I trying to think of? You can have it on a mount where you can essentially just twist the mount out of the way and it'll fold over to the side. I like to have those on a QD as well. So like, you know, I did a lot of SWAT stuff. So for that application, I think the magnifier is great because you can clip it on, go ahead and run it up when you're doing perimeter work. And then when it's time to go in and do the entry and I don't want it in my way, I can either fold it out of the way or I can take it off altogether and just throw it in a pouch, right? Uh, it gives me a lot of versatility in the same gun without a lot of extra weight, okay? Uh, then we get up into like low power variable optics where you've got, um, one power by six, one power to eight, one power to 10, et cetera. You got an LPVO on your gun. Those gun, what's up? One to six. Um, those are great when you know you're gonna be shooting a lot at distance or you're gonna be changing distance a lot for uh, competition shooters in particular. It's nice for me to be able to shoot up close fairly quickly. And then if I'm going back out to two or 300 yards and having to take a shot from there, now I can just crank that magnification up. Okay. It gives me, gives me a lot more distance options that maybe the, the fixed power uh, magnifier with a red dot doesn't. Okay. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier. Most people that are kind of new to carbines, I encourage them, you know, go ahead and just get a quality set of iron sights on the gun and start there. When you're comfortable running the irons and you're familiar with them, go ahead and throw a red dot on there. Um, get the 3x magnifier to put behind it eventually when you can afford it and that gives you a carbine that you can do some really solid work quick uh, at cqb distances all the way out to about three or four hundred yards with no issue okay um, lpvos you know even the even the cheaper ones you're probably going to be anywhere from you know five hundred dollars to you know two thousand dollars to get a good quality lpvo and the, the, the chief drawback, in my opinion, of the LPVO is you're adding a lot of weight to the gun for not a lot of return. Um, like I said, if you're out in the mountains of Afghanistan and you know you're going to be able to take, you're taking five, 600 yard shots, yeah, an LPVO is worth the weight. But if you're, you know, Joe Civilian stateside, you're not going to be using that gun for defensive purposes past two or 300 yards. It's just not going to happen. And you're, it's going to be a very unique situation if it is particularly like in this re in this region where i live out in utah yeah if you're a rancher or something maybe but it's it's really hard for me to legally justify why i shot somebody that was 200 yards away unless they were shooting at me you know so um as far as this eh, i'm gonna go back to slings real quick there's a lot of different sling systems out there. Uh, my preference is a two-point sling where it attaches somewhere at the rear of the rifle and somewhere at the front. Um, I want to set those contact points up in such a way that I can get to all my accessories so I can activate my light. If I've got lasers, I can activate my laser um, and the sling is not in my way. That said, I want the contact point for the connection point for the sling to be as far forward as I can get it without interfering with my lights and lasers. Okay. And then as far as the rear attachment point, a lot of people will put them on the, um, the back plate of the receiver. That's fine. Or my preference is to put them as far back as possible on the buttstock. Okay. But again, it's personal preference. You know, try it, shake it out, see what works for you. Um, some people really like single point slings. One of you guys got a single point, right? I'll clip that thing on there for me. Okay, so the cool thing about a single point is I can go from shooting on my strong side, okay, to shooting on my support side really easily, okay, make that transition there, okay. That's the chief advantage right there of a single point. Now, you can already kind of see what the chief disadvantage is is it's very unstable, right? It's just kind of swinging around out there in the breeze. So with a two-point sling, when you guys got a two-point that's on the gun, go ahead and slap that guy on there for me. So with a 
an adjustable two point if I'm just chilling or I need to work on somebody or put handcuffs on somebody, I just swing back into the sling and it's right here. Okay. It's a pain in the ass for me to adjust this thing to just the right length to get the range of motion that I need. Okay. So typically what I'll do when I do an entry is I just go ahead and swim out of the sling as soon as we do the entry. And this way I have the maximum amount of mobility. I can do whatever I need to do with a gun. Okay. I can transition if I need to transition, no drama. Okay. But I still get the advantage of having it nice and stable and tight to my body. Okay, I can work it around to the back if I need to work it around to the back. Okay, if I need to climb a ladder or do whatever I need to do, right? Okay. Uh, another little, and you, you actually set yours up correctly, but another little tip for setting your slings up, rather than running it on this side, if you loop it over like this, you get a little extra stability. And then when you go to shoulder the rifle, it's still out of the way here like that okay all right lasers cans and other cool but not necessary stuff okay so the ar-15 is kind of like man legos right um, if you got enough money you can put all kinds of crazy stuff on it uh, like i said you can throw an adapter on there um, you know you can have suppressors we can put lasers on the gun we can put infrared on the gun we can put all kinds of shit on there right the phrase that I like to use to address this kind of stuff is let your mission drive your gear train. Okay. Um, if you are living in a one bedroom apartment and your primary purpose for this gun is personal defense inside your home. Okay. You probably don't need a 24 inch barrel AR with, um, you know, a can and, uh, you know, a, a you know, two and a half by 24 power scope or something, right? Um, tailor the gun to what you're actually going to use it for. Okay, now that being said, suppressors are actually really good to run inside a house because it brings the decibel level down to a hearing safe level where you're not going to blow your eardrums out and have hearing loss, okay? Um, when you're working in a team environment, I really like suppressors because it gives a very distinct noise signature. They're not silent like Hollywood would have you believe. It just literally brings the decibel rating down to the point where it's hearing safe or close to hearing safe. But if I'm working on a team and I know that everybody on my team has a suppressor on their gun and now I get a loud rifle or pistol shot within that structure, I know somebody's shooting at us, not vice versa, right? Um, as far as um, lasers go, a visible laser to me has a very narrow application. I don't mind them on a handgun. Uh, I'm not gonna get too far down in the weeds since it's not a handgun class. For a rifle, the, the most useful thing that I have found the laser for is that it gives a visual indicator for whoever you're pointing that gun at that the gun's being pointed at them. Um, during, again, going back to that SWAT context, I found a lot of times that laser induced a lot of compliance, okay? But again, you can't crawl into somebody else's head and have that, that, you know, figure out what their psychology is, what's gonna make them stop doing whatever it is they're doing, okay? In a civilian context, I really don't think lasers on a, a visible laser on a rifle is really all that useful, to be honest. Um, if you have enough money to be running night vision, you definitely wanna have an infrared laser on the gun and probably an infrared light, okay? Um, Something that I kind of glossed over earlier that I want to go back and revisit is uh, the rifle specifically for home defense context, okay? <clears throat> like we identified and we've kind of reiterated over and over again, there's a big ballistic advantage behind having a rifle versus a handgun. It's just more effective on a human body, okay? Um, one of the things that I hear a lot of people say that makes me cringe is that if you use a rifle in a home defense context, it's gonna go through your house and your refrigerator and your neighbor's house and go all the way through your neighborhood and wreak havoc, right? Um, if you're using a, um, if you're using a full metal jacket round, okay, or something like uh, M855 that's got like a steel penetrator core, yes, all those things are very true. It can definitely over penetrate stuff, okay? If you're using a good controlled expansion hollow point, 
you're actually pushing a smaller bullet much faster. So when it makes contact with something, it's gonna shed its core and it's gonna mushroom out much more effectively than a handgun, okay? So if you take um, a handgun or, a, car or a, a pistol caliber carbine and a rifle, and you test them against intermediate barriers like sheetrock, insulation, wiring, that kind of stuff, you're actually getting a lot more penetration in residential type um, intermediate barriers with a nine millimeter, whether it's through a handgun or a longer barrel, than you are with a controlled expansion hollow point and a 5.56. Five, because like I said, it's going faster and it's a smaller bullet and it's just gonna shed its core, okay? So in a lot of cases, the rifle is actually safer inside a structure than a handgun, okay? Um, that is a very, very, very common misnomer. But again, you have to be cognizant. You can't take that green tip, throw it in your gun, and think that it's not gonna over penetrate in a house, okay? So know your gun, know your ammo, know your application.